Through its research and convenings, the Center on Philanthropy and Public Policy seeks to make philanthropy more impactful today and to create a smarter, stronger sector for tomorrow. I'm Jim Ferris. I direct the Center on Philanthropy and Public Policy here at the Price School of Public Policy. And um, I'm just delighted to have you all here. I have um, my class is here and people that are near and dear to the center, uh, funders, uh, colleagues, um, conspirators. Um, um, today, um, we're delighted to have Cecilia Conrad from the John D. and Mar Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, otherwise known as the MacArthur Foundation, that big foundation in Chicago. Um, so, um, Cecilia, welcome home. You're back to Southern California. She is a longtime faculty member and administrator at Pomona College. Um, and she um, has done amazing things in academic life and she was smart enough to get out and go to a foundation um, where she does very exciting um, projects. I, you know, the MacArthur Foundation has a lot of really smart people, but they're sort of experts in nuclear disarmament or housing, whatever. Um, but for some reason, Cecilia gets to do all the fun stuff. Uh, she directs um, the MacArthur Fellows Program, which is known, better known as the MacArthur Genius Awards. Um, she does the special initiatives for nonprofits and arts organizations in the city of Chicago. And most recently, um, she has led the effort by the MacArthur Foundation to run a competition to make one grant of a hundred million dollars. Um, and so today she's going to be sort of talking about that work and what MacArthur and her colleagues have learned um, from this exercise, which is the first time um, they did it. Um, we had Julia Stash here last spring who talked about this. Julia was, um, is the president of the MacArthur Foundation and I won't say on a whim, but it sounded like she just threw out an idea that we do all these sort of special initiatives. Why don't we just sort of have a competition and see what the field wants to do? What do they want to work on? And so that was really the genesis of this um, competition, which has attracted a lot, a lot of um, attention. And um, a lot of people applied for that $100 million dollars and they basically made the award right before the holidays. So um, this is like really fresh, um, and she's gonna sort of tell about that journey and sort of the lessons that they learned and I think are still learning. So with that, um, please welcome Cecilia Conrad. Thank you, thank you. Um, I wanna particularly thank you for inviting me to speak in early March, January, March, January through March, Chicagoans will drop everything to come to Southern California uh, to give a talk. And particularly, as Jim mentioned, this was home for many years. And it was really special to come in from the airport and to sit in traffic on the 405. <laughs> but it was redeemed by this spectacular view of Mount Baldy <laughs> with fresh snow. And it, it made me a little homesick uh, for this place. I, I laugh a lot because in Chicago, I frequently tell people that what I miss about Southern California, besides the, the friendships and the people, uh, was the ability to pick lemons off our lemon trees. And yesterday evening, I had dinner with some people, and in my purse now, I have lemons and tangerines and avocados, and TSA is going to have to pry them out of my dead hands to keep me from taking them back. <laughs> So at Pomona College, I taught economics for many years, and I'm trained as an economist. And as an economist, I tend to think about things in terms of choices and constraints. 
how to alle allocate scarce resources among competing alternatives. If, has it, how many people here have had an intro econ class? You'll remember that definition, right, of economics. It's this problem of allocating scarce resources that draws the thread between my past as an academic and my current work at the MacArthur Foundation. The field of philanthropy is grappling with a series of questions about allocating scarce resources to achieve the greatest social impact. For example, there is a vigorous debate about the pros and cons of perpetuity. Should philanthropic dollars be held in endowments if they could be spent today to solve a problem and potentially generate perpetual benefits? Julius Rosenthal, Rosenwald, the founder of Sears, planned for his foundation to have a limited life, for the assets to be spent down largely in the construction of Rosenwald schools for black children in the South. And so one could argue this is clearly a immediate spending that had a benefit that lasted over a very long time. Or should endowments be preserved to meet the as yet unknown needs of future generations? Another question concerns who gets to make the choices about how resources get allocated in philanthropy. Foundations represent a diversion of public revenues that could be allocated to schools, roads, parks, provision of social safety net through a democratic process, but are instead allocated on the basis of the preference of foundation boards, program officers, and individual philanthropists. These are not decision makers who reflect the diversity of American society. According to a 2015 study, 2015 study, just 16% of foundation board members and 24% of grant maker employees are considered racial and ethnic minorities compared to 36% of the population. Furthermore, much of the new philanthropic capital is emerging from private family foundations and those families do not tend to be from racial and ethnic minorities. And then a third question is how much capital to allocate to a single problem or area of work. Until recently, like many old school foundations, MacArthur had a broad portfolio of programmings, programs spanning issues ranging from affordable housing in Chicago to maternal health in Nigeria and Mexico to nuclear security. The investment in each line of work, each one of those areas, was relatively modest. But we asked ourselves, what if we focused on a narrower range of problems and spent more money on each? Could we have a bigger impact? It is within this context that a hundred and change was born. The MacArthur Foundation took a look at its portfolio and decided to narrow our focus onto what we've called big bets and enduring commitments. And I know those of you who were here last year to hear Julia Stash probably heard a bit about that work. Our big bets represent large investments in trying to solve particular problems, trying to move the needle. And we have defined nuclear security, criminal justice, trying to reduce the rate of incarceration, and um, Oh gosh, now I've forgotten. Oh no, climate. How can I forget climate? <laughs> climate solutions as the two, three big bets. And then we have enduring commitments to the city of Chicago and to American democracy, which we work through on the context of journalism at present. So we've narrowed our focus, but these are areas we picked. And so our president, Julia Stash, kind of posed, maybe on a whim, she likes that story. I'm not convinced she hadn't been thinking about this for a while. <laughs> uh, you know, given that we have narrowed our focus to a fewer areas of work, it becomes even more important that we think about being open to hearing what others think are the really important problems we might put our assets to work towards solving. And so she posed this possibility of let's put a sum of money similar to what we've put in our big bets let's say $100 million, but let's be open as to how we're going to use it. To her surprise, the board said, that's exciting, let's try that. And she came back to the foundation, to our senior group, 
And she said, you know, I put this to the board, and this was the first we had all heard of it, and they said, go ahead. So now we need someone to work on it. I describe this moment a little bit like if you ever see those movies where they say we need a volunteer and everyone else steps back. <laughs> I've been at the foundation at that point for three years. I was kind of new to the philanthropic world. I really did not understand how dramatic and revolutionary this idea was. I, I really didn't fully grasp it. And so I, I was the one who said, OK, we'll take this on. We'll take this process. Beyond the sheer magnitude of a $100 million grant, 100 of change is distinctive in other ways. First, as I said, we were completely open. We didn't define or constrain the problem or the nature of the solution we were looking for. We issued a wide open call. Tell us what problem you can address with $100 million and how you will address it. We asked only that the project meet four criteria. Meaningful. We asked, is the proposal bold? Does it seek to address an important social problem? Will the solution actually make a meaningful, have a meaningful impact on the lives of those it impacts? We asked that it be verifiable. And for us, verifiable really refers to, is there evidence that this will work? So we were not looking for complete innovation moonshot kind of projects. We were looking for projects that had been piloted, or tested where there was a significant body of evidence that could persuade us that if you were successful in implementing the solution, it would have the impact that you expected. Feasible. So the verifiable was, will it work if you can do it? Feasible, could you do it? What kind of team were you proposing? Did you have the expertise that you needed? Do, are there social obstacles or political obstacles that you've thought about how you're going to overcome in order to implement this project? And then our fourth criteria was durable. We wanted the $100 million that we were going to spend to make solve a problem or take a slice of a problem or to unlock the resources required to solve a problem. We wanted it to have a durable impact. So we're really mindful of the fact that we're committing a large amount of current philanthropic resources. We wanted the impact of those to have a much longer life. So we asked that participants, that the competitors tell us how they would sustain the project over after our $100 million was spent. And when we thought about sustainability, we really had several prospects in mind. One is that it could be that there's kind of a magic pill or the magic bullet, that $100 million, once you've done it, you've solved the problem, it's done, it's never going to come back again, ever again in the world. That one sort of lends itself a little bit potentially to technology solutions or to perhaps wiping out a disease kind of problem. One of my examples was actually not in that category. I thought a bit about the issue of lead paint which in the city of Chicago is still a significant problem in, uh, in low-income housing, in low-priced housing market. And some have argued that it is one of the contributing factors to some of the high rates of violence that we're experiencing. So one could imagine, I don't know how many houses $100 million could fix up, but that you could have used the $100 million to remediate the lead problem. We're never going to paint with lead again, and so you would have solved it. So that was one idea. The second idea and this was actually far more common in terms of the kinds of proposals received, is that the $100 million would set up, would be a kind of initial investment. It would set up an infrastructure where there would be an identifiable stream of revenue that could sustain the solution over the long term. It could be a market stream of revenue, or it might be a public stream of revenue. And then the third possibility is that $100 million was going to persuade others and unlock other resources to help to continue the fu to fund the project over the long term. So we defined these four agnostic criteria. They could be applied to any kind of project. And we asked the organizations, these are the four things you have to tell us how your solution will meet. How will it do this? 
With this open call, we gave organizations a lot of freedom. They could design and build their own strategy rather than try to adapt their work to our existing strategic areas or our definition of strategy. One participant told us that this framing of 100 and change was liberating, that it was something they had never been asked to do before, and it gave them an opportunity to think in a way they had not had the opportunity to do before. All right, so openness was one of the things that was distinctive. One of the other aspects of this that was, dis that was distinctive was our transparency. We made public these criteria. If you went to our website, you could actually play with scoring your own proposal along them. We also made public how the, who would be judging the proposals. We defined a panel of wise heads, and at least one's in the room, <laughs> of our wise heads. We drew them from all fields of endeavor, from the public sector, the private sector, from the for-profit, from the non-profit. We tried to put together a really diverse pool of judges. I will say that our weakness was in the non-US. I would have liked to have gotten a, a higher number of non-US. One of the things that I identified there is that the John D. Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation is fairly well known in the US, less well known in some of the other parts of the world. So people didn't always respond to my email. Whereas if I wrote to somebody in the US, they would write right back. Probably because they thought I was asking, I was going to make them a MacArthur Fellow, but <laughs> maybe not, I don't know. Um, but we did a pretty good job of getting uh, this panel of wise heads, and we asked them to score the proposals in that first step. So I want to give you a sense of how, you know, we did a, a big wide call to try and get the word out to as many places as possible. And I had this moment where I felt really good about our effort on that regard. I was on a trip in South Africa, and I was visiting five universities there. And I was at a university, the Nelson Mandela University, which is a fairly new enterprise located in Port Elizabeth in, in the, the Eastern Cape. Not like, you know, Johannesburg or Cape Town, not a big city, a small place. And I was seated, seated at dinner next to their vice president for research and development. And I said, oh, I need to tell you about our new initiative. He says, 100 and change, I already know all about it. <laughs> so. We received, overall, 1,904 completed proposals as part of this. I wasn't expecting 1,904. And recall that these proposals were all going to be judged by this panel of wise heads. We had asked each volunteer judge to read 10 proposals. We had um, promised each proposal that they would be reviewed by five judges. So you do the math. Uh, it, was, it was exciting, but we needed a panel of 404 or so judges in order to read uh, these proposals. The 1904 went through an initial administrative scan and to see if they met our basic criteria. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that towards the end, because that's one of the places where I think we've learned quite a bit. So the 1904, after the administrative screen, screen, screening, we reduced to 801 that actually went out to this panel of wise heads. That happened, let's see, we had the open to the call for proposals in June 2016. October 2016, the proposals were due. In December 2016, our board reviewed the highest scoring proposals, roughly the top 200 of those scored by the judges, and selected eight semifinalists. Those eight semifinalists, and I'll talk about them a little bit more in a moment, those eight semifinalists then went through a six-month period with us where we conducted additional due diligence. We got technical reviews where technical reviews were required to look at the science of what they were doing. We also brought on board technical assistance for them to help really develop robust scaling plans. One of the things that really became clear, if you look at the 800 proposals that even those who got through our administrative scaling uh, review, is that people have really good ideas, 
about defining a problem, actually that's the, you know, most of the proposals defined a problem, <laughs> then they had an idea about a solution. The best proposals, the solution actually applied to the problem they defined. Sometimes it was a little bit of a stretch. <laughs> I, I have to say, though, that one of my disappointments in this process is that I wanted, I wanted more truly wacky proposals than we received. We didn't receive very many truly wacky proposals. Um, and, you know, there were, there were one or two, but, but not too many. So I don't have great stories about crazy things people put out there. But very few of them had a, what I'll call an engineering plan of how they were going to get from where we were now to the implementation of their solution. So we brought on technical assistance from a group, MSI, and they, they actually have online available a kind of scalability assessment tool, which is really useful to look through how you think about scaling, what are the kinds of questions you ask. How do you, do you if you're going to scale by replicating, is what you did in country A going to work in country B? What questions do you, do you need to ask? If you're going to scale by getting bigger, is it that you should get bigger or should you franchise? Should you bring on partners? All those sorts of questions. We also did a lot of work with them on messaging their project, making what we called, making it big bettable. Because we had begun to anticipate that we were uncovering more exciting work than we could fund with a single $100 million grant. And we were beginning to prepare for the notion that we would want others to see these terrific projects with the hope of bringing on other donors. We had the Internet Archive Project, which is a project that wants to digitize a large number of books, particularly those that were produced at the time post-copyright law expiration date through the 1970s and 80s before we started routinely having books coming in two forms and to make them publicly available through really a national public library. We think of that as a Carnegie moment. We had the Himalayan Cataract Project, which is a project that um, is a program to address the absence of trained professionals to do cataract surgeries in many parts of the world. They have a cataract surgery technique that costs $25 per eye. If people here in the room have had any experience with cataract, you know that $25 per eye is really amazing. It's just as effective as the techniques that are used here. And so they have been both performing the surgeries, relying on volunteer labor, but also training local physicians to be able to carry on after the fact. We had the Human Diagnosis Project, which was a project focused on the safety net clinics, the clinics who serve people who are outside of any of our existing health centers, and using e-consults and artificial intelligence to bring specialty care to that group of, of, of uh, clients. We had the Carter Center that had a proposal that kind of fit under my magic pill example to end river blindness in Nigeria. Those four were the semifinalists who did not advance to the finals. In December of 2017, the four finalists presented their projects at a public event, which you can go and look at on live. We still have the, the, the streaming video up. And in fact, I'm going to show you the introductory video from that, just so you'll get a sense of who the four finalists were. Let's change these children's lives now so that in 20 years, they're really productive members of society who are contributing to their communities and making a real difference. Nutrition is a building block, not just for health, but for stability, for growth, and for development. Global progress to improve newborn survival has been frustratingly slow. The time is now to solve this problem. It's an entire generation at risk. If we can't help them to be able to survive and flourish, that is something that's going to affect all of society. So you'll see something about the four finalists. I don't know if, if you've noticed it in that short, short film. The four finalists, as it turns out, without any design on our part, are all focused on children. And that 
just emerged from the process. That wasn't something we started with. And I have to say that it wasn't really until the December 11th event that we had kind of the aha moment that all of them were focused on children. We had Harvest Plus, which is a project that uses biofortification to address micronutrient deficiencies. Micronutrients are zinc, iron, vitamin A, and they are severely lacking in the diets of primarily rural families in agricultural communities in Africa, Latin America, and parts of Asia. They're associated with night blindness, with stuntedness, with diarrheal diseases in children. And yet, through kind of traditional plant breeding techniques, you can take staple, parts of their staple diet and introduce biofortified seeds to improve their intake of those essential nutrients. Rice University, in a project collaborative with the University of Malawi, is an engineering project to adapt the technologies that are used here to support newborns, but that are wholly inappropriate in some environments that are lower resourced. They have what they call the equipment graveyard. And it's all the equipment that we've sent over from US hospitals that dies within a month when exposed to the kinds of climate and power surges and other things that happen here. So they have developed technologies with students at Rice, with the students at the University of Malawi that will survive in that context. They've also created an entrepreneurial infrastructure locally to maintain that equipment and to do those adaptations. The Catholic Relief Services, which is a joint project with Lumos and Maestral, wants to end orphanages as we know them. Over 80% of the children who are in orphanages, in, mainly in the global south, have a living biological parent who would like to take care of them, but who lacks the resources and the infrastructure in order to be able to give them opportunities, and frequently is convinced that they'll do better if they place them in the orphanage than if they place them at home. The evidence really doesn't support that conclusion. And so Catholic Relief Services, Lumos and Maestro want to demonstrate that it's possible to convert these orphanages into family support centers. And then finally, the project that received our $100 million grant was the Sesame International Rescue Com Committee project, which is an early childhood intervention in the Syrian refugee region. And this intervention has three components. One, is something familiar to us, and that is the programming that Sesame has developed, which is not just the media programming, but also a curriculum for early childhood intervention, using culturally appropriate puppets. Tauntaun is the one that is used in um, the Arab world. The second component is the creation of childhood education programs at regional centers that are located both inside of refugee camps and outside of those camps. And the third component is a home visitation program, which involves both in-person visitation, but also uses digital technology to send nudges to the parents in the refugee camp. Now, some of you may be thinking, OK, programming, digital nudges. One of the things that's, that's sort of part of the reality of the world now is that even in refugee camps, television and mobile technology is pretty widespread. So this is a mechanism to reach these communities. So when our board chose Sesame IRC as the $100 million grant recipient, um, it had, it looked at the other three projects. And it was kind of, it was a really special moment because I'll tell you, when you work on these projects and you get to know the teams, each one of us on my team had a favorite. And you go into this big event, into this meeting, and you know that somebody's not going to get the $100 million grant. And you try to steal yourself for it, because it's just going to happen. Um, and, but you start to think, well, what can we do for the others? And you start to worry about it. And we got in the meeting, and the board talked a lot about its, in, how impressed it was with all four of the projects, how they all seemed to meet our criteria about being meaningful, verifiable, feasible, and durable and how all of them had the promise to have a real impact on the world. And it worried that, our, that by choosing a single grant winner, we were going to label 
the non-recipients as losers. And that's important to know because you don't want to stigmatize them as a loser. Is that going to make it hard to get additional funding for them? And so they made the decision right there in the boardroom. And it's just, it's amazing that this happened. That instead of giving out a single $100 million grant, they would give out three $15 million grants as well. So when I called people to tell them, I was able to say, and I always said this first, well, the board was so impressed, they've decided to, to give only the one $100 million grant, because they had made that announcement and they're committed to it, but in addition, they're going to give out three $15 million grants. When I called Sesame, she was so excited about the $15 million. <laughs> and I said, but you're not getting the $15 million. <laughs> you're getting the $100 million grant. So it was a special moment. So in the remainder of my talk, I want to talk a little bit about 100 and change. And I want to do this in terms of thinking about what it tells us about prize competition. And I should tell you that I resisted calling 100 and change a prize competition. And we have been very careful to never call the recipient of the $100 million grant a winner. In my mind, a prize tends to be backward looking. It is either a recognition of generalized past achievements or exceptional promise, like the MacArthur Fellows Program, or it is a carrot designed to induce competitors to perform specific tasks or feats, like a quadruple Lutz. I'm still not quite sure I know what a quadruple Lutz is, but <laughs> it's impressive. A prize imposes a significant resource or cost burden on participants, which they incur regardless of whether they win the prize. I'm reminded a bit when I think about prizes of the fairy tales that I used to read as a child. I'm not sure if people still read the Grimm's fairy tales for the students in the room. But there was always one where some king decided that before you could win the hand of his beautiful daughter, you had to perform three perilous feats. And you know people would come, and they would fail. And usually when they failed, they died. So it was a pretty big cost imposed on them. And then there would always be somebody who no one had ever seen before, no one expected, who would show up and perform the three feats, and then win the hand of the princes. And that was the end of the story. But 100 and Change wasn't like that. We were basically saying, if you imagine that we're the king, we're saying, in order to get the hand of our daughter, you have to write a proposal about how you will slay the dragon if we give you the resources to do so. So we weren't asking people to perform the feat and then you know, with the chance that they might get a prize. We also didn't expect the story to end once we made the award. Once we've made this grant, we intend to be really partners in the implementation of this grant to help them problem solve, to help make adjustments along the way over the five year of the grant period. So I resisted thinking about it as a prize, even though it does share some of the characteristics. It was a burden to apply to 100 and change. We have done some preliminary assessment and some of the participants have told us that it took quite a bit of time and resources to fulfill the requirements of our application. We had a board member when we were first designing this who wanted the application to be a half page. And it wasn't clear to me that was going to work. I'm, I mean, I'm pretty confident they would not have made the $100 million grant on the basis of a half page application. But in the first round, we asked for their evidence. We asked for a 90 second video. And in your spare time, please go and look at some of the videos. They're really entertaining and enjoyable. We told them not to put too much production value in it. And so there's one, people sitting on the sofa talking to you. There's a great one where someone just holds up signs for each slide. There's my favorite one of all is a project involving fixing sidewalks as an infrastructure. And what they did was they showed people, they had people with a, like a little you know, iPhone camera just walking down the street filming the sidewalks and showing you how many bumps and things there were and how many holes, which is a real problem for people in wheelchairs. 
We try to mitigate those costs that we imposed by promising benefits. Every participant who got to the judging panel got the feedback from their judges. Judges had to write feedback on every one of the criteria, and that has been useful for many of those projects. One uh, team in DC actually took their judges' feedback, posted it on their website, and said, the judges say we need to work on this, and they used it as part of a campaign to raise funds so that they could test their ideas more fully. For those who were selected as semi-finalists, there was even a bigger cost burden. Even though we provided the technical assistance and provided a lot of resources, for the smaller organizations, this was a significant time burden that may have reduced their ability to continue with their normal kinds of work. And so that's something that we're exploring. So that's one aspect we clearly share with the prize. We also uh, note that of the levers that have been identified as the ways that a prize competition can achieve change. Some of you may be familiar with the report McKinsey did about prize philanthropy, where they identified seven ways, seven levers I'll call them, that where prize philanthropy can achieve change. We clearly manipulated five of them. So I think I had to come to access that indeed this was a prize competition, but maybe it falls outside of these various types that have been identified. It's kind of a new form of prize philanthropy. I want to walk through these five, the five of these that I think we operated and give you a sense of what we learned and how we did. So the first is identifying excellence. We worked with a prize design firm, Common Pool, Jason Morgan of Common Pool, I think a couple people know him here in the room, who helped us design this competition. And early in the process, he asked me, what will constitute success? And I answered 50 highly qualified submissions. 50. <laughs> we got 1,904, broke it down to 801. One could argue that we got our 50 uh, high quality submissions out of that. I want to think about the 50 not just based on our own scoring, however, but also on the kinds of reactions they're getting from the field at large. And so one of the things that we're, kind of, we're monitoring is how those 50 are, whether they're attracting other philanthropic capital, how our, our top 200 is attracting other philanthropic capital. The second is influencing public perception. Some critics of 100 and Change, and there have been a number of critics, some critics of 100 and Change have complained that it was overhyped. That may be fair, although I think one of the things that's important is that we were trying to achieve multiple goals here. Some of those goals, like changing the way we found projects and what was happening internally, really didn't need publicity, but others, like reaching to networks beyond the foundation's current networks, reaching that guy in South Africa, required a lot of marketing and publicity effort. And the goal of trying to produce some attention for all of the applicants to 100 and Change, bringing attention to the very promising solutions that they were proposing, was another way into which it required a great deal of marketing kind of effort. Focusing communities on specific problems. I said earlier that we defined 100 and Change to be wide open. So one could argue that we didn't try to focus the community on solving a particular problem like curing river blindness or, or ending malaria or any of those kinds of things. But I think we were trying to focus the community on the concept of solving a problem in a durable way. And as an add-on to that, was a focus on how do you scale from something small that works to something large that works. Mobilizing talent, we were trying to reach outside of our network. Many people have said to me, well, but you ended up giving the grants to organizations that were well known and well established. What happened to the guy in the garage? I think of the guy in the garage as equivalent to the 
person who shows up for nowhere and slays the dragon and, and takes the princes. But if you'll recall, the way we designed 100 and Change, we were focused on evidence and feasibility. So we kind of knew going in, it wasn't going to be going to a guy in the garage or a girl in the garage. <laughs> that we were going to be looking at organizations that had the capacity and the experience to actually carry forward with the solution. Different kind of competition might go after the novel solvers who are out there. Strengthening problem-solving communities. One of the kind of really gratifying aspects of 100 and Change are the stories that we are collecting from participants. Not our eight semi-finalists or our four finalists, but participants who might not have even been in the top 200, but about the ways in which 100 and Change focused them as an organization on thinking about how you could do something really big, that it focused them on an organization of recognizing what capacities they possessed and what capacities they lacked and where they could find the appropriate partners. There's some particularly great stories emerging off of university campuses. And I'll say just as a little aside, one of the things that became true in 100 and Change is that university submissions, which was a little less than half of the total, were overrepresented in those that got the highest scores from the judges. And later, if there's time in Q&A, I can talk about why I think that was. But overrepresented in what I'll call the top 200. But among our eight semifinalists, there is only one. And part of the reason is that universities are accustomed to thinking about problems and research kind of at this level, but haven't much, don't have much experience in actually implementing them and doing them on the ground. And so what was interesting on the university campuses is that some universities had their own competitions in-house. University of Pennsylvania had a competition they said, okay, we're only going to submit one proposal to 100 and change. We want people to submit their ideas. We're going to decide in-house. And they discovered that their engineering school had a project, and their social science school had a project, and they were both addressing the same problem, and they had never talked to each other before. And those two projects were merged together to become their 100 and Change submission. And some of you may have heard of the submission because it's been getting some attention in the media. Freakonomics did a story on it, led by Angela Duckworth. And it's about sort of how can you use mobile technology to nudge people to good behavior. So it's a joint project of those two. So we think we did some work in strengthening problem-solving communities. We weren't really working on educating communities, so I want to talk finally about mobilizing capital. When we started 100 and Change, we were focused on finding our grant recipient. And as I said to you before, I was kind of a newbie in the philanthropic world and was a little bit surprised at some of the reactions that 100 and Change was generating. I would get phone calls. And the phone call would be from a, somebody heading up a program at another foundation, and it would say, so this 100 and Change, it really is an open call? Yes, it's really an open call. And it's really open to all fields? Yes, it's really open to all fields. And are you insane? <laughs> <laughs> and then they would say, well, I think you are crazy, but I really want to see what you get, because we have been afraid to do an open call. We were afraid to just open those doors because we weren't sure what would come across the transom. So we began to recognize that, there, that what we had done, in addition to helping ourselves find a grant recipient, was that we were creating a huge public resource, a database, that contains all of these ideas about how to solve problems. And so the challenge for us, and some of those ideas maybe weren't ready for 100 million, probably most of them weren't ready for 100 million, but five million or even one million to test, and then a five million. So how do you kind of get those out to the donors? It's unfortunate, and this is one of the things we learned, that we hadn't thought of this in the beginning because I may have changed some design elements. We basically had to retrofit the data in order to make it accessible to others. But our goal is to try and mobilize capital of all levels towards these projects. We've been developing tools to make them accessible. 
Uh, one of the first things we did, and you'll see this map up here in the upper left-hand corner, is on our competition website, we created a top 200 kind of mapping for uh, those who were interested in finding out what projects were available in their, were, doing, were working in their geographic area, or you could search by topic area. And the idea was that this would be available both to donors, but also to organizations who might want to find out who's doing work in the same space. We then also did a partnership with the Foundation Center. And I particularly want to point to this. This is the lower, this is right here. It is a solutions data bank. The Foundation Center used their machine learning algorithm to tag all of our projects according to the sustainable development goals and some other existing taxonomies. You can do text search. You can do location search. You can do geography search. I mentioned to a couple people here that tomorrow I'm doing a talk at First Five LA, and I, I did a search on early childhood programs. And so that's another resource that we have made available to the general public. Each of the 1,900 submissions, actually it's a little less because some people opted out, have a page here at the Foundation Center that describes their project, describes who the funders are in that space, and gives you a sense of other similar projects and some resources. So it's a value to both the participants, but also to donors who might be interested in those spaces. So we've created these tools. The last one I'll mention is the one on the left. We worked with uh, the Center for High Impact Philanthropy at the Wharton School that annually produces something they call the Annual Giving Guide, where they have gone through a particular set of topic areas or problem areas and done research on what seemed to be the most promising practices, and then put together, I call it the Neiman Marcus catalog of projects. We asked them to use their screen on our 100 and change projects. So rather than using our criteria, they used criteria that they've developed to identify promising projects, and have put together a high impact giving guide that looks at and identifies 12 of our top 200 as exemplars, plus some other organizations doing similar things. And this has gone out to donor networks, uh, to their mailing list, and is also available online. So we have tried to steward this public resource of information and make it available. But then you've got to get people to use it. And then you have to get people to actually open their pocketbooks and give out the funding. And here, the jury is still out. We have had some success with our four finalists. I'll say that the board's decision to give what we've called, we don't call them C grants, because 15 million is more than a C grant. So we're calling them nest eggs. I guess they're dowries. That might be the right thing. Our decision to do that has, has actually really helped to spark interest. And so the three $15 million grant recipients have all gotten attention from other sponsors. With Rice, I am really close to packaging the full $100 million. Um, with the Harvest Plus, they have decided that they want to kind of do some more proof of concept with our $15 million and then use that to leverage more funds. With the CRS Lumos Maestro, there are actually two kinds of things that have happened as a result of our project. One is that we are working with some other donors who are interested in funding this initiative. But the other is that as a result of the publicity around 100 and Change, our overhyped project, 20 orphanages have contacted them and said, we want to transition from being orphanages to being family care centers. So even without money, that's a major kind of accomplishment. So our three finalists all appear to be getting some attention from other donors, and I'm very optimistic about that. We worried a little about the Sesame IRC project, because remember, our 100 million is for a project that is a specific project. It's not general operating. It's not all these other kinds of funds. So we were concerned that we could crowd out other funders. That has not happened so far. And indeed, what we've heard is that they are getting attention from funders about, if you're going to do this in the Syrian refugee region, could we fund something similar for the Rohingya in Southeast Asia? Could we look at some of the other refugee uh, 
problems around the world and do the same thing. So for that group, we're doing pretty well. For the others, I can document about 12 million in additional funds. I've heard stories that go beyond that. But what we are confronting there are two kinds of challenges that I think say a bit about the promise of something like 100 and Change. One is that foundations have their strategies. Recall, this whole started because we wanted to do something outside of our strategy. And so one of the challenges is convincing foundations to take a look at projects that they didn't identify first. A second problem, which is actually turning out fairly well for us, is that there are also these early funders. Our entire 100 and Change is really predicated on the notion that there were funders who funded the testing of the idea. And one of the things I learned partly through the process, I started calling some of those earlier funders, and I found out they were a little annoyed that they had discovered these projects, and now we were making, you know, overhyping them to the world, and they were not getting credit for the fact that they had been the early funders. So we changed that. We made a big deal about the early funders. And we have brought them on board to help us to identify larger donors, donors with larger capacity, who might be able to help take them to the next level. We had hoped to reach ultra high net worth individuals to come in and fund some of these projects. And that has been one of our bigger challenges. I've learned a lot from reading a recent report called The Giving Journey, uh, from, done by Open Impact, that talks a bit about on what motivates individual philanthropists to give. And what we've learned from that is that it requires that they come along on the journey. And we didn't bring them along on the journey, partly because we didn't think about it until towards the end, to be honest with you. And so one of the things that we have learned for the next go round of 100 and Change is that we're going to try and bring in others who might be interested in funding projects from the very beginning. When I, after my first year of college, I went home and I, was in, I had had kind of a rough year in my first year of college. And I thought I had to tell my parents about how I'd gone. And my dad said to me, he interrupted me and he said, are they going to let you register again? <laughs> and I said, yes. And he said, that's all I need to know. <laughs> so in some ways, the ultimate assessment of this first 100 and change, even at this early stage, is are we going to do it again? And the answer is yes. We're going to make some changes. Now that we've conceptualized it, not about just picking our grant, but is actually kind of exploring and developing and identifying what the promising solutions are, are out there in the world and getting them in front of other donors, we're going to try and engage them earlier in the process. We also want to give a longer launch pad to participants because we had hoped that people would form communities and maybe find collaborators with each other. I was struck we had one of our eight semifinalists was the Himalayan Cataract Project, but we had, I think, 12 in the top 200 projects involving delivering eye care. And none of them, they, didn't, they weren't connected. And it would have been great to have connected those. So we'll try and do that. We want to study those costs that we imposed on participants and to figure out how can we reduce them, how can we make it most, less burdensome. And in particular, we want to decrease the percentage of applications that got turned down in administrative review and didn't go to the judges. And we're thinking of ways of doing that in terms of self-screening, self-auditing, other forms of maybe preliminary judging that we might do before people have filled out the whole application. My problem my first year of college wasn't that I didn't study hard enough. I just wasn't very efficient. A hundred and change, we believe, has the potential to be an efficient mechanism, if included in a portfolio of mechanisms, for identifying promising projects, not only for us, but also for the philanthropic community as a whole. We think it is a promising mechanism to improve the allocation of scarce resources among competing alternatives. I look forward to your questions and any advice you have on how to make it better. Thank you. And I was just wondering how worried were you about crowd out 
when you were designing the program? Because one of the things, like, for example, you say a lot of the people who didn't get the award now are getting funded. To an economist, that would be crowd out, that you know they're getting money despite not getting your award. But I see your logic about that you're helping, him, you're helping them get the money. But how do you, in some sense, figure out whether truly there is crowd out or not? I think they're, they're, you're right. It's a little early to tell. Um, our concern, and I'm not sure it was there when we designed. We, as I mentioned, we had this whole thing was predicated on the idea that there were solutions out there that had been funded and tested, but that did not have the money to bring it to scale. And if you look at the landscape, and we just did a kind of mapping of this, of grants, $100 million grants outside of grants to hospitals and universities, there's just hardly anyone in that space. So we weren't so much worried initially that we were going to discourage others you know, from, from, from doing the scaling up funding because they weren't doing it. But as we started to realize that you know, there were these early funders for projects and that we had not early on done a, done a really good job of cultivating them, um, that there could be a problem that early funders could say, well, now that you have the 100 million from MacArthur, you may not need our funding. It's not important anymore. And this is one of the struggles, one of the challenges with trying to actually build some collaboration across funders is that each funder wants to feel like their money made the difference. And so you have to think about how you do that. At universities, you name things. I suggested to Harvest Plus we start naming crops <laughs> as a way of doing it. But, but so with Sesame and IRC, I think what we would look at is whether or not they lost any of their general operating support, because that's what we were really afraid of. And so far, that hasn't happened at all. Um, and so that's, that's what we want to monitor. What was the time implementation period that you gave these groups to A, start their project, and B, get it done? Otherwise, it would seem like you're just creating another foundation. Yes, that's a very important point. We have a five to six year time horizon. We are making our grant over, over five to six years, and we expect that at the end of that, they have to define for us very specific milestones, and we want it, that progress is being made. And we've also sort of said the whole, whole project, we should see in 10 years' time that what you've done has had an impact. So there is a sense of this not being a new program that we actually do expect this to finish in a compressed amount of time. Otherwise, we could have just set up a new program. Hi. Thank you for the presentation. It was wonderful. Um, what plans have you guys made or maybe things that you've already done to connect a lot of the ideas, even the ones that haven't made it to the finals, with government agencies that might be looking for really new, innovative ways to improve their allocation of resources? That's a really, really exciting point because we have been successful in getting attention from USAID um, for particularly the global projects. They sent representatives to our big event. There is an agency that's very similar in Australia that also was going to send someone but didn't, but we've been in communications with. We have talked to people at DFIT in the United Kingdom. We have some connections going with Norway. So um, we, we are reaching some of the other government kinds of agencies to use this database. And that was one reason for getting them all tagged with the sustainable development goals. And so that's promising. It's just getting started. The, the other thing that we have been working on a bit is reaching a little more globally in terms of other funders. We are, had some conversation happen at the African Philanthropy Forum. And in particular, I have been working on the Carter Center project, which to me is almost, this project is just, in, it's just ready to go. It's like shovel ready, if you want to use that term. They've been doing what they do. They know how to do it. It's a great project for someone who doesn't have a staff or you know, big infrastructure around their philanthropic giving. So we're trying to reach some of the donor, emerging philanthropists there. We had representatives from the Tata family come to our event in December. And so we're, we're doing that. And then the other thing is that we're all going out and talking, <laughs> trying to reach those audiences. Our group ran a prize 
our first competition for excellence in skilled trades teaching mm. in American public high schools. Every bit of it, from thinking about how many applicants would come to how many judges you need and what a, all of it. Um, my question to you is, can you give us a sense, and, and it was for just a half a million dollars to start, and about wore us out. So, uh, and next year, or this year actually, the same kind of prize to elevate these teachers, their work, many of the criteria you used, it all resonated in a beautiful way. Can you say how much, or so, you know, how much this cost you, the foundation, to, you know, to actually operate in this gorgeous, expanded, way and if you think you'll find efficiencies next time or not so much? Yes. Um, so I have been working on a rough kind of estimate. Um, I'll say it's still rough because I haven't completely added in some of the things we plan to do this year to get projects out. And it has cost us about a million and a half, which is not bad at all. That's in outgoing expense. I am not including the toll that it took on me physically or <laughs> because it was a little crazy. The other thing that's interesting about this project internally at MacArthur is that we ran it, I call it a ragtag ban. At most of this process, there was no full-time employee assigned to it. It was all people who had been coming from our other programs and even outside of our programs who helped the administrative review was done by 40 members of the MacArthur staff who volunteered their time, and they were drawn from all levels of the staff to do the review, plus six hired people from a firm called Legal People that consist of people who haven't passed the bar yet, and they're waiting. <laughs> it's a great source of labor, by the way, <laughs> if you need skilled labor. Um, and. And so, you know, I probably, if you added in the kind of staff time, it might push it up closer to two, to two. We are hoping to achieve some efficiencies. If we could reduce some of the burden of doing the administrative review and of, of sort of responding to the applicants. Um, here's the other thing about this. 1,900 applications, there were really only 40 who were very angry at us. Now, I was a dean, and that's a low proportion of people spending their time being angry at me. Uh, I thought that was really pretty good, and we tried to you know, talk to each one of them and explain what was going on, and we ended up, I think there are two who probably still are pretty angry at us, but <laughs> I think that's pretty good, but that was time consuming too. So we're hoping to realize some efficiencies there. We're gonna look into whether there's some um, machine learning that we can use to go through the proposals. We're also probably gonna be a little tighter we were truly open. And now I think we understand that the probability of the $100 million grant going to a three-person organization is low. And we should say that up front. And you know, we had all kinds of, well, if you don't have audited financials, just tell us why. Now, no, that's a good signal if you don't have it. So I think there's lots of things we'll do to try and tighten that a bit and sort of reduce that, that burden. The, we've also talked about whether there's additional things we can do to change the order of the technical review versus the wise head review. So we're, gonna, we're, we're looking at all of that process to see if we can, can make it better. And then there'll just be an advantage that we've done it before. So we have a lot of templates we've developed. You, know, like did the, the, you didn't get, the, get it letter, we've already gotten place and those sorts of things. So I do think there'll be some. 